Hello everyone and welcome back to Creature Archives. Today we're continuing the series Evolves Fiction. In this series, I take iconic creatures from movies, myths, and games, and reimagine them through the lens of real-world evolution and biology. What if these creatures actually evolved on Earth? What would they look like? How would they survive, reproduce, and interact with the ecosystems around them? In today's episode, we're finishing off the OG Pokemon starter trio with Blastoise. This turtle is one of the most iconic water-type creatures in all of Pokemon. Built like a living tank, complete with a massive shell and twin water cannons mounted on its back. So we asked the big question, could an animal in real life actually evolve to resemble Blastoise? More specifically, is it even possible for a creature to develop the ability to fire pressurized jets of water as a natural weapon? Let's find out in this episode of Creature Archives. Before we start speculating on how a creature like Blastoise could evolve, let's first take a look at its evolutionary line. We'll start at the beginning with Squirtle. Squirtle is a small, turtle-like creature. According to the Pokédex, it will spray water at enemies and retreat quickly into its shell when threatened. As Squirtle evolves into War Turtle, its design shifts towards increased power and aquatic specialization. It becomes bulkier, and its feathery tail and ear structures enhance its balance and control in the water. And then comes Blastoise, the final form. It has underwent a massive departure from the sleek agility of its earlier stages. The soft decorative features are gone, replaced by raw bulk. It now possesses a heavily reinforced shell and a pair of enormous water cannons emerging from its back. These cannons are described as capable of launching high-pressure water jets powerful enough to pure steel. Now that we've traced how this evolutionary line builds up to Blastoise, we can identify the biological challenges centered around making Blastoise a real animal. Unlike Venusaur's complex plant-animal symbiosis, or Charizard's questionable vertebrate anatomy, Blastoise is mostly a straightforward turtle-like creature, but that simplicity does little to hide its most impressive and problematic feature, the ability to fire powerful jets of water from built-in cannons on its shell. Biologically, evolving weaponized pressurized water jets, especially from cannon-like structures embedded in a creature's body, poses significant challenges. It would require specialized organs to store and rapidly eject water under high pressure and finely tune control mechanisms for targeting, all while preserving the structural integrity and defensive function of a turtle-like shell. Luckily, though, we're not starting totally from scratch in the animal kingdom when it comes to animals evolving means to use pressurized liquid as weapons. While there's no animal that fires water from its back, nature has still found some clever ways to weaponize liquid. A few remarkable species use pressurized jets for hunting, defense, and mobility, and understanding how they do it will help give us a blueprint for what might be biologically possible in a creature like Blastoise. Our first inspiration to draw from is the archer fish. This unassuming little fish is one of the most precise marksmen in the animal kingdom. It hunts by shooting water jets at insects resting on leaves or branches above the surface. To do this, it forms a narrow groove by pressing its tongue against the roof of its mouth, and then it snaps its gill cover shut to force out a powerful jet of water. That jet accelerates as it passes through the groove and exits the fish's mouth, traveling up to a meter or more of surprising accuracy. Even more impressive, the archerfish times their muscle contractions so that the rear of the stream travels slightly faster than the front, causing the water to converge mid-air and hit the target with maximum impact. Our next example is the spitting cobra. Unlike the archer fish, which uses its jets to knock prey into the water, the spitting cobra fires liquid as a defensive weapon. When threatened, it sprays venom directly at an attacker's eyes. This venom is propelled through forward-facing fangs, which have been modified with small holes near the tips. When the cobra contracts the muscles around its venom glands, it blasts the fluid out in a narrow, high-pressure stream. Some species can do this from up to 10 feet away with remarkable accuracy. While it's not firing with as much force as a cannon, the cobra's venom spray is still another clear example of a vertebrate evolving precise pressurized jets for survival. In addition to these, many invertebrates also utilize pressurized liquid in numerous ways for all sorts of purposes. Bombardier beetles defend themselves by mixing chemicals in a special abdominal chamber, creating a boiling hot noxious spray that it blasts at attackers in explosive bursts. Velvet worms shoot twin streams of sticky slime from nozzles on their heads to ensnare prey using sudden muscle contractions to build pressure. And even some squid and octopus use powerful water jets for propulsion, expelling seawater through their siphons to make quick escapes. All of these creatures show us that nature is more than capable of building systems that pressurize and eject liquids with speed and control. Whether it's water, venom, chemicals, or slime, the core ingredients are all the same. Muscular or elastic chambers that build pressure, narrow openings that increase expulsion speed, and anatomical structures that help aim or stabilize the blast, giving us a good blueprint to work with to make Blastoise's water cannons a reality. So let's dive into how exactly Blastoise's iconic cannons might actually work. And then after that, we'll explore how, when, where, and why such incredible structures could have evolved in the first place. First off, the cannons themselves would be specialized openings or nozzles, mounted just behind the shoulders on the shell. These would be lined with keratin, the same tough protein that makes up turtle beaks and reptile scales. 
That gives the nozzles the durability they'd need to withstand repeated high-pressure blasts with water. These nozzles would be anchored deep into reinforced sections of the shell, with bony ridges around the base acting like shock absorbers to manage the force of each blast. And when not in use, each nozzle would be sealed by a muscular valve, functioning like a biological pressure cap, able to seal shut and keep the system watertight. The real key to the system, though, lies inside the shell. Blasters would have a pair of muscular elastic water chambers. Think of them like biological water balloons, tucked just beneath the shell and resting behind the lungs. These chambers likely evolved from soft tissue structures found in reptiles today, like parts of the throat or cloaca. Over time, they would have developed into tough contractile sacs, surrounded by smooth muscle capable of rapidly squeezing down to generate pressure. To fill its water chambers, blastoids would use powerful throat muscles to gulp in water and drive it into the reservoirs, similar in motion to how some amphibians force air into their lungs, but adapted for liquid intake instead. When it's time to fire, blastoids would contract the muscles surrounding those water sacs, forcing the liquid through narrowing ducts that connect to the cannons. The narrowing of these ducts accelerates the water, releasing it as a focused high-velocity jet. Looking at real-world animals like Archerfish or Spitting Cobras, it's plausible that Blastoise's jets could reach speeds of 15 to 20 meters per second and potentially fire up to 40 feet away, enough to knock prey off balance or send smaller creatures tumbling into the water. As for aiming, Blastoise's cannons wouldn't swivel like turrets. Instead, it would shift its forequarters or tilt its body to line up a shot. It's a simple, durable solution that still allows a surprising degree of control. And with two twin jets of water firing at the same time, it would increase the likelihood of hitting its target. Of course, a system this powerful doesn't work in isolation. Blastoise's entire body would be built to support its unique ability. Size-wise, Blastoise's shell would measure roughly 5 to 6 feet long, weighing in between 400 and 700 pounds, with a robust, heavily muscled frame built for semi-aquatic movement. Its shell stands about 3 feet tall, forming a protective dome that not only shields its vital organs, but also anchors the hydrojet system securely in place. To make those water blasts count, Blastoise has also evolved much more highly enhanced binocular vision than most turtles. Its eyes would be set more toward the front of the skull, giving it excellent depth perception, essential for judging distance and hitting moving targets. This is a similar adaptation to what we see in Birds of Prey or Big Cats, allowing Blastoise to line up a shot with deadly precision, whether it's knocking a bird from a branch or stunning a small mammal by the river's edge. Once it knocks its prey down, Blastoise's curved keratin beak comes into play. Similar to modern snapping turtles, this beak would be especially robust, perfect for gripping, tearing, or crushing. A bird or mammal knocks from the air wouldn't stand a chance once Blastoise clamped down with that hook tip. Finally, its forelimbs would be heavily muscled with webbed feet and sharp claws designed for both propulsion and gripping terrain. These limbs would allow it to swim with power, dig into riverbanks, or even wrestle prey underwater, making it a formidable force in semi-aquatic environments. So now that we've laid out the anatomy of Blastoise and how its hydrojet system might work, let's take a step back and look at the bigger picture. Where could such a creature evolve, and what kind of environment would push it to develop something so specialized? The answer likely lies around 15 to 10 million years ago, during the Miocene Epoch in what is now South America. At this time, South America was still largely isolated as a biological island, separated from North America and other continents. This isolation created unique ecological conditions. The continent was crisscrossed by vast warm river systems, early versions of the Amazon and Orinoco basins that formed extensive wetlands and floodplains. These rich aquatic environments supported incredibly diverse ecosystems filled with small mammals, birds, reptiles, and amphibians. Many of these animals forage near the water's edge, making them perfect prey for an ambush predator waiting in the shallows. In addition, South America's long isolation also meant something very important, a lack of large mammalian carnivores. Without big mammal predators dominating the landscape, reptiles, including turtles, had far more ecological opportunities to evolve into strange specialized forms. In fact, even today, some South American turtles, like the Mata Mata and the enormous extinct Stupendemus, show just how flexible turtle evolution can be. In this dynamic ecosystem, a large semi-aquatic turtle ancestor of Blastoise could have evolved the pressurized water jets as a novel way to capture prey. Instead of chasing after quick, agile birds or mammals, this turtle's jets would blast prey off perches or startle animals near the water, sending them tumbling in, where the turtle could then easily catch them. Now that we understand the environment, let's explore how Blastoise may have actually lived and behaved in it. Blastoise likely led a semi-solitary lifestyle, much like modern snapping turtles or crocodilians. Individuals would patrol long stretches of riverbanks or flooded forests, maintaining overlapping but loosely defined territories that shifted with seasonal flooding. During the dry season, Blastoise may have become more territorial. These territorial disputes were likely resolved not through direct combat, but through non-lethal hydrojet displays. Males in particular may have engaged in ritualized splash duels, where each would fire a short, powerful burst at the other in an escalating contest of strength, precision, and stamina. The loud impact of water against tree trunks or the surface of the river could act as both a warning and an intimidation display. 
While typically solitary, individuals might have tolerated each other during the breeding season or in areas with high prey density. Juveniles may have occasionally formed loose aggregations in safer shallow waters. Blastoise likely had a strong spatial memory, helping it navigate complex river systems and return to familiar basking, nesting, and hunting areas year after year. Some researchers have speculated that its longevity and intelligence may have supported a degree of rudimentary social learning, such as younger individuals observing and mimicking older ones when targeting prey or managing threats. Blastoise likely reproduced much like modern freshwater turtles. During the wet season, females would emerge from the rivers to dig nest in soft, sandy soil along the banks. Using their powerful forelimbs, they would excavate shallow pits, carefully positioning the eggs to avoid flooding and reduce the risk of predation. Clutch sizes likely range from 5 to 15 eggs, with incubation lasting several months depending on ambient temperature. As with many reptiles, the sex of hatchlings may have been temperature dependent, with environmental conditions playing a key role in shaping population dynamics year to year. Unlike most modern turtles that abandon their nest after laying, blastoise may have exhibited increased parental care. Given the high density of predators in Miocene wetlands, females could have remained near the nest site, deterring would-be scavengers with defensive posturing, or even quick intimidating water blast. This simple but effective behavior would have dramatically increased the survival odds for vulnerable hatchlings. After hatching, juveniles likely stayed close to shallow water, learning to swim, dig, and eventually control their developing water jets under the protection of their mother. This extended maternal care would have been rare among reptiles and a key factor in maintaining the success of such a highly specialized species. Perhaps most astonishingly, blastoids have an extraordinarily long lifespan, with some individuals potentially living well over 200 years. Several factors contributed to this longevity, a slow metabolism, powerful defenses, and minimal risk of predators once fully grown. Over such long lifespans, individual blastoids could witness multiple generations of offspring reach maturity, often returning to the same nesting sites decade after decade. This extreme longevity wouldn't just benefit reproduction, it would also allow individuals to accumulate a lifetime of environmental knowledge, seasonal flood patterns, nesting grounds, prey migrations, and more. Over time, this ecological memory could give older blastoids a major edge as ambush predators, helping them dominate their niche for centuries. Of course, behavior ties directly into survival strategies, especially when it comes to feeding. Blastoise was primarily a carnivorous ambush predator, relying on stealth, patience, and explosive force to secure its meal. From beneath the murky surface or camouflaged among thick plants on riverbanks, it would wait until the perfect moment to strike, firing a focused jet of water to knock a bird from its perch or stun a mammal or reptile stopping to get a drink. Its prey would have included a wide variety of riverine and terrestrial animals. Its keratinized beak was ideal for delivering a quick lethal bite capable of tearing flesh or crushing bone. But Blastoise wasn't a pure predator. When prey was scarce, especially in the dry season or during population bottlenecks, it likely became opportunistically omnivorous. It would forage for aquatic vegetation, such as floating plants, roots, and algae, as well as crustaceans, mollusks, and aquatic insects buried in silt. Its strong, clawed forelimbs were well suited to digging through muddy substrate, while its water jets could dislodge prey hidden in hollow logs, tangled roots, or plant mats. Even with its powerful defenses, however, Blastoise wasn't invincible, especially as a juvenile. Young Blastoise would have been vulnerable to a wide range of predators in the Miocene wetlands, Giant crocodilians like Perusaurus, massive flightless terror birds, and saber-toothed marsupials could easily overpower a smaller mid-sized juvenile. Even large predatory fish like Miocene catfish or mega piranhas may have posed a threat to offspring. As it grows, however, Blastoise becomes a formidable opponent. Its thick, dome-shaped shell, anchored into the vertebral column, offered heavy protection from bites and strikes, while its ability to launch a rapid water jet in defense allowed it to startle or confuse predators just long enough to escape. A sudden blast to the face of a lunging predator could disrupt their attack long enough for Blastoise to retreat into deeper water or brace itself defensively. Competition for food would have come from other semi-aquatic reptiles, large predatory fish, and occasionally terrestrial carnivores venturing near the water's edge. However, Blastoise's unique hydrojet hunting method allowed it to exploit a niche that few others could. This gave it access to arboreal or shoreline prey that crocodiles or fish couldn't reliably capture. Its ability to feed across multiple habitats, terrestrial, aquatic, and even aerial interfaces, it faced less direct competition than other predators of similar size. Remarkably, this species managed to survive from the Miocene epoch relatively unchanged, much like other turtle species and crocodilians. Over tens of millions of years, it became more specialized, its hydrojet system more precise. Hidden deep within South America's sprawling wetlands, it thrived with little evolutionary pressure to change further. Sheltered by the dense river systems and vast floodplains, it remained isolated and unseen by modern humans for a long time. It had no confirmed interactions with humans until the 1800s. As European explorers pushed deeper into the Amazon basin during the Age of Natural Discovery, they encountered native tribes who spoke of ancient river beasts. Massive turtles said to spit water with enough force to knock monkeys from trees or blind a man at 20 paces. 
Some tribes referred to them with reverence, others with fear, describing them as guardians of the flooded forest or spirits of the river. These tales were often dismissed by naturalists as exaggerated folklore, creative interpretations of real animals like caimans or snapping turtles. However, the rumors were too consistent to ignore. In 1834, a German naturalist led an expedition into the Upper Orinoco, and though he failed to capture a specimen, field journals included detailed sketches and behavioral notes of a giant aquatic chelone incapable of ejecting water at range. His team observed what they described as a thunderous splash, followed by a pair of rigid nozzles emerging from the water, like twin periscopes, which expelled twin jets that startled a flock of ibises from the nearby trees. His notes were met with both interest and skepticism back in Europe, but they planted a seed. Then, in 1872, during a joint British-Brazilian scientific expedition, a juvenile was finally documented using its water cannons to dislodge birds from a riverbank. Though the photographic plates were blurry and only captured still glimpses of the event, the accompanying field sketches and written accounts left little doubt. For the first time, the world had visual evidence. This creature was real. Dubbed Testudo hydrofarox, or the furious water turtle, the species became a zoological sensation. It represented not only a biological marvel, but a living fossil, an apex predator that had remained hidden for millennia. By the early 20th century, conservation efforts were being proposed as sightings grew rarer due to human expansion and hunting. Today, Testudo hydrofarox would likely be listed as critically endangered, protected in remote wetland reserves, and kept in zoos. Footage of an adult firing its hydrojets in slow motion would be a coveted treasure in wildlife documentaries, a living reminder that even the strangest legends sometimes have a kernel of truth. Thanks for watching this episode of Evolve Fiction. The art for this video was created by Delta Reaper 54 so if you want to see more like it, be sure to go check out their work. Their info will be in the description below. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like and subscribe so you won't miss any future content. And let me know down below what kind of videos you'd like to see in the future. And a special shout out to our channel members. Thank you so much for your support. Until next time, stay curious, and I'll see you all in the next video.